Welcome, hobby enthusiasts. Thank you once again for joining me for this episode of Diecast Emporium. Now, normally I would include this kind of video in either the HO files or a segment of Military Mondays, but instead I really wanted to do this as its own separate entity uh, because I think it really deserves it. And although it could go in either of those two segments, like I said, I think this really kind of deserves its own special video. So with that out of the way, as you can tell from the title, what I am attempting to do here is I'm attempting to build an impressive small 187 scale uh, armor museum that is not exactly based, but heavily influenced by what the old Pat Museum used to be mixed in with the Aberdeen Proving Grounds and really some other military-based museums that I've seen uh, over my time. So again, it's not based on anything specifically. It's an algamatum of all of those things mixed together, kind of all reimagined. So you're going to see some tanks from the last 100 years from various different conflicts and countries, and then some vehicles that aren't necessarily tanks that I think kind of deserve their own place or their own spot in this museum as well. So with the introduction done, Let's begin. This is the building that will serve as that museum. Specifically, this is a kit by Walther's, and it is the engineering office. Now, to be honest, when I purchased this, I purchased this on the internet, and it looked a whole lot bigger than what it actually is when it's assembled, but that's okay because it is a three-story building. Now, of course, you wouldn't want to have heavy armor or tanks uh, on your second or third story of a large building because that's just a, a recipe for disaster. But we can imagine in 187th scale, that's, you know, that's the whole point of a hobby is to be somewhat fictitious. And uh, despite the rivet counters that uh, watch my channel, I, I ask you guys to use a little bit of your imagination. Because when this is done, we will have tanks and vehicles on all three floors. Maybe the top floor will predominantly be some of the lighter rubber tired vehicles with our gift shop. And I do plan on really bringing this alive. So really the outside is done except for maybe a sign, some lights, maybe an awning. Uh, but the inside, I do want to do individual floors, some staircases, again, the gift shop at the top, putting all the vehicles in, um, really making this look like a museum. So I work on this a little bit when I have the time in between all my other obligations that I have with this channel. Um, so that's my long-term plan. So that's the building. We'll turn this on. We'll let it rotate. Uh, it's very simple. It's a very simple build. The paint that I use to mimic the brick finish uh, is, I think it's dark red from Tamiya, if I'm not mistaken. I believe that's exactly what it's called. The top of it has this skylight finish on top, which I really like. And it's not out of the realm of possibility that one of these older style buildings would be retrofitted uh, as a museum. So I really, I do like the way that it looks. But Enough about the actual museum. Let's start by looking at the vehicles that are inside. Now, this is going to be a long video, so I ask you guys to bear with me. I really hope that you enjoy this. I'm going to try and be brief as I can with each of these, while at the same time allowing enough time to explain each and every one of these pieces to you. In no particular order, let's get started. So the first one that we're going to be taking a look at this is a 3D printed model. It's available from a seller on eBay. Forgive me, his name escapes me. This is the World War I Mark VIII tank. Now, this tank actually never saw combat uh, in World War I. Unfortunately, the war ended in November of eight, uh, in 1918 before the majority of these could even be produced and brought to the front. Now, the interesting thing about this tank is many of you might know, especially if you are tank enthusiasts that have come across this video, that most of the World War I tanks were either classified as either male or female. This is a hybrid. This is actually uh, not a male or female tank. It's a little bit of both. And depending on whether or not this was a U.S. tank or a British tank, it was either known as the Liberty or the International. So... Some interesting tidbits about this. The The actual 3D print of it is somewhat detailed. And, and again, I, I do plan at some point of really highlighting this with paint, bringing it out. You can see the side guns, the machine guns up here. The tracks look really good. Um, it, it's a, and Again, it's, it's printed in some heavy material. It's not light plastic, so it's got some good weight to it. Um, but I wanted an example of a World War I tank. This is really as close as I could get 
within reason, NHO scale, because for a lot of reasons, I, I guess, that are unbeknownst to me, a lot of tanks are modeled in 176 scale and 172 scale, so it's really hard to get your hands on exactly what you're looking for in HO scale. Okay, next up, we're going to World War II now, and you'll get to see a lot of stuff from World War II. First off is a British M3 Grant tank. This version is by Johnny Lightning, and this is based on the tank called Monty. And this one fought off Rommel in North Africa, and it even commanded ground forces all the way through the Normandy invasion of D-Day. So a pretty influential tank, and I really, again, I really like what uh, Johnny Lightning did with this. There's a lot of detail, whether it's decos and the functionality that's on this thing. Again, truth be told, this one is not exactly HO scale, but it's close enough for government work. It looks just fine when posed next to some of these other vehicles. So with that said, I'm just fine with it. All right. Next up, we have a vehicle that technically is not a tank. It is a World War II Rocco Mini Tanks US M7B1 Priest self-propelled artillery. Uh, the reason that this was known as the Priest is if you look right here, this little circular device kind of looks like a podium that the Priest would stand behind during Sunday Mass, so the troops so aptly nicknamed this, the Priest. Now, the undercarriage may look very similar to a Stuart tank or the Sherman undercarriage, and that's because a lot of this was taken from Sherman's. And uh, it's about, the undercarriage is roughly about the same size as some of the, uh, the early versions of the Sherman tank from the war. Speaking of Shermans, let's go there. Love them or hate them, Sherman tanks are... Even to this day, when you think about military tanks, a lot of people, this is what comes to uh, their vision, their mind. This is what they think of as a tank. But the reality is, early on in World War II, these things were death traps, and they were very, very dangerous for tank crews. Uh, it wasn't until late, much later on in World War II that the guns were uh, increased, the armor was increased, they moved the ammunition storage to a safer and better place inside of these tanks so that if it was hit, it didn't necessarily light the first time or explode. So being a tanker and a Sherman, especially during the early part of the war, uh, was very, very dangerous. And what a lot of people don't know is that during World War II, tanks were not meant to fight other tanks. Uh, specifically, the U.S. tanks were not meant to go up against German tanks. They were designed to support infantry advances. Uh, if you came up against a tank, so let's say you were in a group of Shermans, you were supporting an infantry advance, and you came up on a couple Tigers or a couple Panzers, you were supposed to call in one of these, which is an M36 Jackson Tank Destroyer. By the way, both of these uh, are by Rocco Mini Tanks as well. Now, the whole idea of the tank destroyer is in its name. This is intended to destroy enemy tanks. It has a larger gun. It has sloped armor. Uh, it's not necessarily quick, but it has the ability to engage the enemy from a farther distance and with a better chance of knocking the enemy tank out. Again, this is by Bully. Um, a lot of these vehicles that you're going to say, I guess this is a, it's you're going to see in this video, this is a good time to point out and give a huge thanks to Greg from smallscalehobbies.com. I, uh, I let him know what I was doing here, and I, I purchased a lot of my military models from him. And I told him I'm doing this HO scale mini museum, and I sent him a list of what I was looking for, what I, what I wanted, and he came through in a big, big, big way. He supplied a lot of the models that you'll see here. It gave me a great deal on pricing. Um, so that we can, so that I can show you guys what's out there. If you ever want to buy any of these, or really if you want to add these to your collection, uh, but moreover, to me, just to have a really good little small scale realistic uh, tank museum. So I really have to thank Greg again. If you have not checked out his website, smallscalehobbies.com, I encourage you to check it out. There will be a link in this video's description as well. Okay, let's stop with the American stuff for just a minute. This is made by, I believe the name is Como. It's a Russian company. This is a T-34-76. Many scholars will tell you that this is the best tank of World War II. Now, what you see on it 
is really what most tanks of today have, and that's the sloped armor. Pretty impressive that the the Russians back in the 30s and the 40s were already ahead of the game with sloped armor when it comes to when it comes to deflecting enemy rounds. Um, and it, not only was it that, but it had the ability to mass produce these at such a rate that it really was a case of quantity over quality. That's one of the many reasons why uh, the Russians were able to defeat the Germans. And uh, again, very, very good tank. As far as the model goes, the detail on this is extremely impressive. Uh, as you guys can see, all the different paint highlighting. This is one of my favorite tank models. Again, as small as this is, it just looks so good. And it's nice to have a sample of uh, something the Russians used. Next up, we have a uh, BT-7 light tank, another Russian tank. These were produced from 1935 to 1940, used extensively during the war effort. Not exactly sure who makes this. Uh, it doesn't specify anywhere on here. This I tried to paint with a little bit of an interesting color that I mixed together. I tried to get close to like a Russian green. The thing is, if you look at reference photos of Russian tanks, it's never really the same color in World War II. It's kind of like they just picked whatever the hell they had lying around, um, which makes sense from a historical background. So a lot of the Russian tanks and vehicles from the war never really are close to being the same color. So this is the color I came up with this. I may at some point end up starting over, but I'm, I'm kind of happy with the way this looks. Again, this is another vehicle that Greg provided for the sake of this display. Next, we're going to go over to Germany for a bit. We have the World War II German Panzer III. Now, the only thing I did to this, this came painted in this North Africa tan, is I added the German cross to this. Everything else I, I left as is. Again, another tank that I really like the look of. And I know it's sacrilege to say this, and I don't mean this to really upset anybody, but you got to give it to the Germans, man. All of their equipment, their tanks in particular, not only were they far superior to anything we had at the time, uh, but they just looked so good. And I, I got to say, part, part of that's due to the fact that they were being made by companies like Mercedes and Audi, and the list goes on. So uh, you, gotta, you, you have a little bit of that German engineering and that German quality even in their military vehicles. Next, we have the German, uh, I believe this is a Panther Panzer tank. This is by Boley. Again, another one that uh, I did nothing to it. This is the stock model. Another thing that the Germans were experts at is adaptive camouflage. And what I mean by that is it didn't matter where they were, whether it was the, the mid of winter and everything snowy and white, or whether they were in the jungle, for example, something like this with jungle camouflage or urban camouflage. They were so apt at adapting their vehicles to the environments that they were around and um, and they became experts at ambush tactics. So essentially they would lie in, in wait for an enemy column to drive by, and then they would just engage him and shoot him. So they became extremely effective at that. And unfortunately, more often than not, it was us that was on the wrong end of things. Again, especially during the, the, the first part through the mid part of, uh, of World War II. All right. Now we have probably, again, it's arguable, a lot of people will disagree, but I think this is probably the most feared tank of all tanks in World War II. This is made by Herpa. This is the World War II German Tiger tank. Specifically, this is done up in a Battle of Kursk livery paint scheme, call it what you will. I love the details on this as well. You have your entrenching tools, uh, ammo boxes, all of your vents and such are detailed as well and painted. Obviously, you have your road wheels, your tracks. Again, just an extremely impressive model in this small of a scale. 
And again, I really think if you were especially an infantry soldier or even an armored column early on in the war and you came up against some Tigers uh, or even some Panzers and you're like, "Uh, this is going to be a bad day for us, especially those that watch their Sherman rounds bounce off the enemy armor, I can't imagine that feeling. Now, the way that they got around this is if you could get behind one of these tanks and score, you know, a couple rounds up the backside of this, or you could knock the treads off the tank. That's that's really that, that really was your best your best bet. OK, now for something a little bit slightly more modern from Russia. And unfortunately, this is back when they uh, when they weren't our allies. This is by Herpa. We have a T-55 uh, tank. This specifically is in the Vietnamese Army livery. So T-55s were, were began production in 1947. You can still find these in developing nations and still out on the battlefield. I know when we first went into Afghanistan uh, in the early 2000s and even before that in Desert Storm, the Abrams just made quick work of these tanks. But Saddam's army... The Republican Guard units, they, they had tons of these. They're still out there. Um, so you will see in developing nations, even today, some of these T-55s around. So, again, this one specifically by Herpa is in the Vietnamese Army uh, livery. So there you go. All right, back to the U.S. for a while. First up, we have an M48A1 Patton MBT, or main battle tank. So the M48s were produced from 1952, and they stayed in service until 1987. Uh, really, the Abrams main battle tank is the direct replacement for this tank. Um, and it was really, the Abrams was the direct replacement for the M48, the M60, all of those tanks. And both the M48 and M60 you can still find all throughout the world. And developing nations still in service, and uh, yeah, it's it's kind of shocking when you think of the fact that we, the United States, still had a lot of these M48 tanks in service up until the late 1980s. Now this kit is pretty cool because not only do does the main gun and the turret rotate and move, but so does the secondary armament with the machine gun. A lot of casted in details all throughout. You can really do a number on these uh, mini tank Rocco kits to really bring them out and look good. All right, here's one that I have already started working on a little bit. This is an M103 uh, heavy tank, also by Rocco Mini Tanks. This has been sprayed in Tamiya Olive Drab. These were in service from 1957 to 1974 with us in the United States military. You can see just how large and long of a main gun this tank had. So this would have been pretty prevalent during the Cold War era, Vietnam era. That's when you would have seen these around. Next, we have a Rocco Mini Tanks Cold War Vietnam Gulf War era second generation main battle tank. This is the M60. Now, Another interesting aspect about this particular model kit is that it does come with the uh, the A3 version tur uh, turret if you want to switch it out. But again, this is the A1 version, as you can see. But you can make it either or, depending on what you would prefer. And uh, M60s, again, these were in service up until the late 1990s. In fact, doing research on this... Uh, the U.S. military had these up till 1997. Hard to believe because that's, you know, that's over 10 years that the Abram was in service. The Abrams, yet this was, they still had these around. Some of the National Guard units and such were using these. All right. A much smaller tank. We have the Vietnam era, also again from Rocco Mini Tanks. This is the M41 Walker Bulldog. This is a light tank. This had a relatively short service record of just over eight and a half years from 1961 to 1969. So not really sure what the deal was with this one. I think probably once the um, 
once the M48 was in service, there really wasn't a need for a light tank, is kind of what I'm assuming. Uh, because once you have a main battle tank, there's really no need to have light tanks. That's my assumption when it came to this one. All right. We have the Vietnam era, also from Rocco Mini Tanks, US M551 Sheridan, right here. This again is a uh, another light tank. This had a relatively long service record from 1969 to 1997. So this probably would have been your direct replacement, in fact, to your Walker Bulldog. Um, because this, again, was released the year that they retired the Walker Bulldog, so that actually makes sense. All right, let's take a break from tanks. I told you there was going to be some extras here, because in a museum you would find, you know, not just tank items. I have a Maisto M3 Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle, or IFV. Again, truth be told, this is not exactly HO scale or 187 scale, but it is very close. Um, I love these infantry fighting vehicles. They have been in service since 1981. They saw extensive use in the first Gulf War, Afghanistan, and in Iraq. Uh, I actually, personal connection here, uh, many of you guys know what I majored in in college. And uh, one of my thesis paper, one of my finals paper was I did if the U.S. military had Bradley tanks during the Black Hawk Down situation. Um it would have been a hugely different outcome for our troops on the ground. Um, and actually, there there was a, a panel investigation that went in because there was a request during that that went out for armored vehicles and even for Abrams, but of course it was denied because they thought it was going to be too much of a, a black eye or you know too much attention brought to what was going on in Somalia. But the truth is that had they had armored vehicles instead of Humvees and flatbed trucks, there would not have been 18 Americans that perished that day. Obviously, there still would have been some loss of life, but nowhere near that extent. So, that is the Bradley. This model is one of my all-time favorite military models. It is a Arsenal M resin kit, again, that I got from smallscalehobbies.com. This thing is would not surprise me if this is the B-52 of ground vehicles, if this thing sees service for over 100 years. This is the um, the Paladin, the M109 self-propelled howitzer. This has been in the arsenal since 1963, and it is scheduled to remain in the arsenal probably for another 15, 20 years uh, at the minimum. What I love about the Arsenal M kits is not only do you get a nice model, but you also get accessories. So you, I have jerry cans here, I have the gun, I have ammo cans and such that I have painted uh, in olive drab just to give it a little bit of detail so everything's not necessarily in desert sand. Um, and because it's resin, it's, it's a pretty hefty model, and I really enjoy it. It allows for more of the casted-in details to stand out. And it is exactly HO or 187 scale, so it looks really, really good. So that's the M109. Another Arsenal M kit. This is the M88 Hercules, which is our heavy recovery vehicle. Um, primarily used to rescue damaged armored vehicles such as tanks and Bradleys, uh, but really th these have been used extensively. Uh, for really the last 30, 40 years. Oftentimes you'll see these loading damaged vehicles onto the Oshkosh Het or Heavy Equipment Transport Truck. The model, pretty functional actually. You can raise the large crane. I kind of rigged a little rudimentary hook here. Um, I, I could probably have done more with it had I taken my time on it. And that's the thing with these. You can always, you know, you can always change, you can always adapt and, and improve on these but I really like the way that it looks right now. That's the Herc. All right, we have another Rocco. This one is not an assembled kit, so you have to put this together. This is the Ace, or the Armored Combat Earth Mover. Cool thing about this is it's really a mix between a bulldozer and a scraper. It can fit its full bowl up right here. It's got a dozer blade on the front. It's obviously a tracked vehicle, so it can pretty much go everywhere. Um, the Army uses these extensively. 
and uh, it's it's a pretty cool piece of specialized equipment. Really, when you're building uh, tank berms or even when you're building fobs, forward operating bases, a lot of times you'll you'll see these. All right, I have two different versions of things to show you now. We have a Rocco Mini Tanks M113 and an Arsenal M113. These are armored personnel carriers. Been in the U.S. Arsenal since before the Vietnam War. As with a lot of vehicles from that time period, and really if you want to take it past vehicles, a lot of pieces of military hardware, of course I'm talking most specifically about the M16, a lot of things that came into focus during that time period, people either loved or hated because there was a lot of issues associated with technology at that time. Um, these specifically would often get stuck in the Vietnamese jungle. They had a lot of re uh, reliability issues. If they hit a large anti-tank mine or you know, a Vietnamese trap, for lack of a better word, because the Vietnamese were great at uh, using their environment to their advantage, unfortunately these had a lot of issues with that. That said, they uh, continue to be in the U.S. arsenal, and obviously technology has evolved. These have been up-armored. These are used as medevacs. They're used as engineering vehicles, troop carriers. Uh, there's even a, a anti-tank, or excuse me, anti-air version of one of these. So it's a very versatile platform, and it's a pretty cool piece of equipment as well. Um, so the M113 has come a long way. And again, it'll probably be in the, the arsenal for at least another 10 years, minimum. So there you go. All right, back to World War II for just a few more minutes. We have two versions of the Venerable and Everyone Loves Half Track. Now, this version, an olive drab, is a mortar carrier version by Matchbox Collectibles. And this version by Johnny Lightning has really a troop carrier back with a 50 cal mounted on the top of it. Uh, the, the half track, again, another versatile platform of truck, if you want to call it a truck. Um, AAA versions, anti-air versions, gun platforms, uh, medevac versions, troop carriers, mortar platforms, you name it, there was a variation for that during the war. What really made this truck or vehicle really come alive is the fact that it not only had tracks, but it also had a wheel in the front. So it was able to go over rough ground, particularly in the European theater, and then later on in the Pacific theater, uh, and not get stuck or bogged down like a lot of the rubber tired vehicles like Jeeps or Deuce and a Halfs would do. So um, again, a unique piece of vehicle. And it's really, I, I kind of feel like there's a place even in today's military for half tracks. I really wish these were still around. Um, because I, I just think it's great. You know, the, the Russians, they have a version of a half track today, um, that they, that they use for pretty much everything. I, I just, I think there's a place for it in our military. I'd love to see the half track come back, but that's just me. I'm a sucker for old vehicles. All right. I don't have all the details on this. This is an old Jeep. I don't know if it's, you know, Willys or what version. Obviously, it's from World War II. This is another one that Greg supplied for sake of the video review, so I have to thank him for that. Getting towards a half hour here, so I'm going to speed this up with the last three models. Next, we have from Rocco Mini Tanks as well. This is the US M1 155mm field gun used throughout World War II and Korea. Nickname for this was the Long Tom, so I'm kind of partial to that just because I share a name with it. This can be towed behind trucks or half tracks or whatever. And obviously with a 155 millimeter, uh, this would do a lot of damage. And last but certainly not least, what is a tank museum, an armor museum, if you don't have an example of the world's deadliest tank on the battlefield today? So from Boley, we have the M1 a1 Abrams main battle tank used extensively by the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marine Corps. These really, really have been a valuable asset to us um, throughout Grenada, throughout the Gulf War, throughout Afghanistan, and throughout Operation Iraqi Freedom. This tank will probably stay as the main battle tank 
well into the 2050s. That would not surprise me at all. Thank you guys so much for watching. That concludes this video. Let me know what you thought down in the comments section below. And if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to give it a like. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you in the next review.